Hi, this is Emily Saliers from Indigo Girls, and you're listening to Rainbow Country. The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the persons appearing on the program. Throughout her career, she's blazed a trail for the diva and anti-diva in all of us. In her autobiography, she offers a no-holds-barred look at her adventures in the music industry, from opening for the likes of David Bowie to having R.E.M. open up for her and her band. Today on Rainbow Country, Agent Provocateur, Carol Pope. That and more in episode 420, so stay tuned. The Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hello, my name is Conchita. And I'm Barbecue. And my name is Hardcora. And we are the The Beat Girls. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Hello and welcome to a brand new journey through Rainbow Country, as I like to call it, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. And as always, I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country. I'm producer and host, Mark Tara. By the way, Rainbow Country originates from CIUT-FM in Toronto and now proudly in syndication across Canada from coast to coast to coast. The Yukon, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the east coast of Canada in Newfoundland, Ontario, even down to Buffalo, New York, and online. Well, thanks to you tuning in, streaming, downloading, but ultimately listening. Together we continue to build Rainbow Country into a nationally syndicated gay radio show, as well as being recognized as a number one Canadian LGBT podcast. So today, award-winning Canadian music icon and agent provocateur, Carol Pope, joins me to talk about new music, new audiobook, new documentary, and more. Plus, in Hour 2, on this episode, we'll hear the full 1982 album of Rough Trades, Shaking the Foundations. All that lies ahead as we start Journey 420 through Rainbow Country. First up, Keith Benny, the Senior Director of Audience and Community at the Toronto International Film Festival, talks about just what we can expect at TIFF 2024. Keith Benny, hi, how are you? Hi, Mark. I'm great. How are you? I am well. I am well. I am well. Okay, let's jump right in. Uh, 2024 marks the 49th edition of the Toronto International Film Festival. For TIFF 2024, generally speaking, uh, Keith Benny, what can audiences expect from this year's festival? I think 2024 is is a return to the festivals that audiences would have seen pre-pandemic. So the size and scale of the festival is um, on par with editions, you know, in 2019, 2018, before obviously, you know, the world changed and we did digital film festivals. And, and even the film festivals of the past two years were a bit of a, uh, you know, building back. And so, you know, in 2022 was the first year without restrictions. Last year, we had the actors strike. Uh, and so that really affected the the Hollywood kind of star power. And so everything is kind of back to equilibrium now. We have a huge slate of films, over 250. We have a huge music focus this year. Uh, there's a lot of documentaries. So Elton John, Bruce Springsteen, Andrea Bocelli, Pharrell, Tragically Hip, uh, a lot of uh, really great music and film pairings this year. So this is a, a gay radio show, and there are a number of LGBT films that are part of this year's film festival. There's, uh, I believe it's a documentary, Will and Harper, uh, mm-hmm. that's uh, from Will Ferrell, from SNL days and all that sort of stuff on a road trip with 
with him and a transgender friend. Yeah. There's also a film called Queer from Luca mm-hmm. Luca Guadagnino. Mm-hmm. I've been practicing that name. <laughs> and I <think laughs> you I you still, did it very well. I think I still messed it up. <laughs> but he, he did um, Call Me By Your Name, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. that starred um, Army Hammer. And, yeah. And Timothy Chalamet. Timothy Chalamet, yeah, absolutely. In regards to the, the LGBT contingency of films, like, uh, there are feature-length films, there are short films, what's mm-hmm. on your radar So, yeah, Queer by Luca Guadagnino. Um, As you mentioned, you you know, we know him from Call Me By Your Name, uh, Challengers, which was the the film this year, um, uh, and I Am Love. But you've never seen Luca Guadagnino like this, uh, doing an adaptation of William S. Burroughs, which uh, is challenging source material, but it has all of the Guadagnino uh, distinct hallmarks, you know, surprising and um, interesting music choices, heightened and elevated production design. Um, Daniel Craig plays Ali, an expat in post-war Mexico City, who is wandering its streets, um, frequenting gay bars, and and really looking for um, uh, you know a companion. Uh, and and so it really follows uh, his journey in a very surreal and hallucinogenic kind of way. Um, really interesting film. I'm really curious to see how it how it lands with audiences. Very different from Call Me by Your Name and Challenger. Still has that kind of sensual. Um, uh, quality, but it's it's a lot more surreal, and so um, some really interesting scenes in that. And you know, Gluka is is usually known for finding new talent, and I think Drew Starkey, who plays um, the love interest in the film, will will definitely uh, find this uh, to be a launching ground for him. Um, and then I, I want to pick up what you said about Will and Harper, which completely kind of different. This is a very heartfelt documentary that, as you said, follows Saturday Night Live alumni Will Ferrell and Harper Steele um, as they go on a a road trip through the U.S. And so they met each other um, at Saturday Night Live in 1995, and they've been been friends ever since. And when Steele uh, kind of announced her transition, um, Will Ferrell reached out and and decided that they could go on this road trip and really reaffirm their friendship. And so the, the film rolls and um, you know, you see them and, and what it means to have a, you know, a relationship uh, within today's very divided culture in the United States around trans rights. And so it, it follows them over 16 days as they journey from New York to um, Washington and, and throughout the United States. So um, two really interesting films. Uh, and um, yeah, I think I think both of them will be really well received by audiences. Okay, so this year in in twenty twenty four is the is the first year that that Rogers is presenting the Toronto International Film Festival. Just a yeah. little, uh, just a little aside. I remember back in the day being at home and watching mm-hmm. on Community Channel Ten because they would stream live during the festival the oh, the press the press conferences for the films, mm-hmm. and it was such a highlight. I thought that you know. On TV, you're watching live, uh, live coverage of the Toronto yeah. International Film Festival from Rogers. Do you, th- maybe not this year, but maybe in future years, do you think that that could happen again? Well, we're, you know, I'll say that we're very grateful to be working with Rogers this year. Um, you know, they believe in the mission of TIFF to transform the way mm. people see the world through film. And, um, uh, you know, uh, to your question, I think our goal is always to try to bring as many audiences into the film festival as possible. You know, whether that is, you know, coming down to King Street and, and attending a screening or sitting outside of a fan zone mm. or just being part of the energy. And so um, all different types types of digital ways that we can engage audiences who may not be able to come down uh, and take part, Mm -hmm. um, we're definitely exploring. And so um, some of our Q&As, filmmaker Q&As, you will see reposted on TIFF social channels Mm -hmm. and we'll, Mm -hmm. you know, work with our partners to amplify that content as well. And so, um, yeah, we're we're really excited to have Rogers on board and and looking forward to the partnership this year. It's almost like a a bit of a homecoming in a sense, because I guess maybe they were like a, a media sponsor back in the day or something, but mm-hmm. now they're presenting the festival 
Excellent. Yeah, I, I'll say that, um, you know, the other part of my role at TIFF is uh, I, I oversee the film reference library as well, which is on the mm. fourth floor of TIFF Lightbox. And, um, you know, I, I see a lot of the art, uh, archival and uh, kind of old images of the festival. Mm-hmm. And you're right, th- those those Rogers microphones with the, um, you know, the kind of Rogers icon in mm-hmm. front of everyone at the press conferences. I've seen many images with that. Uh, mm-hmm. So it, it, that, that, that image is very kind of iconic from some of the early like 1990s film festivals. So September 5th to the 15th, 11 days of Canadian and international cinema, special events, mm-hmm. talks. My last question for you, Keith Benny, do you have any advice for people that may be attending the festival, uh, maybe one day, maybe a series of films during one day, mm-hmm. maybe attending over multiple days? Any advice to any film goers during TIFF 2024? Yeah, absolutely. And and it's a great question because sometimes the festival can feel hard to penetrate. You know, there's 250 films. Where do I start? Where do I begin? So two pieces of advice. One is join a rush line. Um, for those who have never joined a rush line, that is, you know, you lining up outside of a cinema, um, hoping that there'll be additional seats uh, that audience members from the street will be able to join. Um, it, it's a great way not only to see a film a, in a spontaneous way, you might not even know what you're going to see, but you will know that the caliber of the film you're going to see is, is outstanding. But it, rush lines are a great place to meet people from all over the film festival ecosystem. So you could be in line with someone who volunteers for TIFF or you know a student from a local university and college who's studying film or someone from the press or industry. And so the rush line is kind of like that um, beehive of activity where people will tell you what they've seen, what they recommend. And so joining the rush line, I think it's something I always recommend to people who are first timers to really get that film festival energy. And secondly, come on down to King Street. We, we do something called Festival Street for the first um, four days of the film festival. King Street is shut down. And so it's a kind of open street festival where we have um, all different types of audience engagement. Um, you can take in the sites, sit on a patio, people watch, uh, really get the the feel of uh, the energy that TIFF brings to the city. So Rush Lines, Festival Street, those are your two best bets for an entry level to the festival. Well said, well said. Keith Benny, well said, well done, well curated. Thank you for your time. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Mark. I, I always enjoy speaking with you. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good evening and welcome. It's the opening night. Tonight, we thank you. I am so humbled and so grateful to be here this evening. I'm extremely excited to be here. Thank you all for Holy shit, there's a lot of y'all. Um, I'm very proud to be here tonight, and I'm so grateful that you joined us. Well, stop till you get enough. Hello, Toronto. Happy Halloween, Michael. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Toronto, the best of them all. If you ever think about the big face, the watch things, it's different. I want to thank Toronto because you have always honored, celebrated, exalted female directors. The warmth and the love that you gave me is something I will never forget in my life. It's so exciting to be here at Toronto in this gorgeous theater. This is just like Christmas Day. Thanks to you for coming. This is truly a very special evening for me. This is why we do what we do, you know. I love this festival and it's an honor to be back. Behind me is what we call society, what we see in our every day and what we have on the screen. Let's keep on doing movies about us. We're making pictures about what's happening today in society. Thank you, thank you for coming! The Toronto International Film Festival runs September 5th to the 15th. For more information, simply visit tiff.net. When I return, Carol Pope. Hi, everybody. This is Gino Vanelli. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara.
fighting constant addiction my patience is wearing thin uncover the enemy within I am well. I am well. I have to say, thank you for being here to have your voice, your story be heard by the LGBT community and beyond. So thank you, uh, Miss Carol Pope, to talk about all things you, 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 and uh, and you. Okay, I want to start here. I believe 2001, you released your autobiography, Anti-Diva. Uh, went on to become a bestseller for you. Uh, at the time of this recording right now, the time of uh, us doing our interview in in 2024 on Amazon.ca, the ebook is currently number 44 on Amazon.ca's punk music chart. Number 44 on Amazon's punk music chart. In 2024... In August, the audiobook for Anti Diva is out right now, unabridged, over eight hours. You are the narrator of your story, the audiobook. How, here's my first question for you How did this audiobook come about? I. I don't know. Oh, um, <laughs> Randolph got hold of me and just said, Do you want to do an audio book 24 years later, 23 years later. Who got a hold of you? Random House. Penguin oh. Random. Left my publishers. Um, and I was like, okay. And then when I was recording it, I was like, can I change some stuff? And they're like, no. <laughs> you, have to, <laughs> you have to read what's, you know, what you wrote. So, because I just wanted to edit myself. So they approached you. Yeah. Do you know why? Because it has been like a hot minute. <laughs> it's been a hot few years. <laughs> um, because I think audiobooks are very popular. Mm -hmm. And at the time that we released, uh, at the time of the original publication, there were no, I don't think people were doing audiobooks. The internet was just not that mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah. How, I mean, it makes sense to me. It makes perfect sense. How was the process of of uh, narrating your own, you know, part of your life story? What was that journey like for you? Um, it's really difficult to record an audio book. Um, and, I, and my engineer told me a lot of, like, actresses who, actors and actresses who do it have... Uh, trouble with it too. You have to speak really slowly, and um, you know that's not the way I think. I mean, I I talk, you know, sort of fast when I'm talking, or and, oh, and you can't mumble, and you know, you have to enunciate. Um, and then it was just weird, like uh, reliving my past like that. So it was a little traumatic. And then towards the end, I got into it. And I was like, I wish I could do this all over again, because now I get how to do it. But they're like, that's what everybody says. Wow. So y y you just mentioned it there a bit. You wrote this. This this came out in 2001. And you, you wrote, you know, you put pen to paper in, and you told, you know, your story. But in, here we are in 2024, and here you are having to read those words that you you wrote all those years later and having to verbalize them now and you just said you know relive them how did those words hit you today when you had to read them um well some of it i was fine with and then some of it 
I was like, I wish I could rewrite this part or delete this part, you know, I mean, because it's like years later. Um, so, and a couple of people were mad at me when it, you know, when the book came out, I'm like, oh no. Um, so yeah, it was weird to have to relive that, but most of it I was, I was pretty happy with. Mm -hmm. Do you think those people that were mad at you when the, the, the book first came out, do you think they're going to be mad at you again when the, now that the audio book is out? Oh, probably. I don't know. <laughs> Some of them are dead. So that happened a lot. I'm uh, like, every, every time I was reading a chapter, I'm like, oh no, that person died. Or, mm. you know, um, it was hard reading about my brother who passed from AIDS. Mm -hmm. and it was, you know, and writing about Dusty Springfield. Um, although that's one of my favorite chapters. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't, I haven't really read my book since I wrote it. I mean, I, I've looked at parts of it, but I haven't reread the whole thing. Now people can actually hear it. Yes. The, the, the words, the term anti-diva, what does that mean to you? Um, well, at the time, I was like, I'm not really a diva, and I don't like the whole diva thing but you know I am a diva in some ways <laughs> when it comes to uh, performing and you know having things the way I want and not having to put up with too much crap but in general I mean I'm not you know I mean to me like a diva is J-Lo or something you know somebody who wants like so much crap in their dressing room and paint my dressing room white and the toilet's going to be, you know, like insanity like that. I'm not that. I'm just like, give me a cheese plate and some water and I'm good. <laughs> and some kitty litter. <laughs> yeah, some kitty litter. I don't know why I said that. It just came to mind. I so, like it. <laughs> so so Anti-Diva is the name of your, your autobiography, as well as the, the audiobook that's out now. It's also the name of a new documentary that's coming in 2025, Anti-Diva, The Confessions of Carol Pope, uh, directed by award-winning uh, filmmaker Michelle Mama. Uh, and this is going to feature interviews with the likes of Katie Lang, uh, Rufus Wainwright, Nona Hendricks, love her, uh, George Strombolopoulos, Jeannie Becker, how involved are you in this documentary that's coming in 2025? Um, they just basically follow me around and annoy me. And <laughs> okay. <get> stuff. <laughs> um, you know, they came to L.A. I'm in L.A. right now, which I'm so over. And um, uh, we did some shooting in New York. We did shooting in Toronto. We shot, they shot some rough trade stuff. They shot some solo stuff. Um They've interviewed Kevin Staples and, you know, other people that I've worked with, uh, my guitar player, Tim. Um, so, yeah, I i don't know. I mean, I can't wait to see the edit. And I, I'm like, I don't want to see myself. Let's have just more of everybody and less of me. <laughs> so how long has this documentary been in the works? Was this something that uh, uh, was initiated by yourself or did... Did someone else come to you and say, hey, let's do this? Oh, Michelle Mama. Um, I think it's been, she's the one who approached me because she mm. was the one to do a doc about me. Mm. Um, because she's like, she's like, Carol, you're like the Where's Waldo of, <laughs> of pop because you've been everywhere and met everybody, which is kind of true. Um, so... I was like, okay, and then I, I guess it took them it took them a couple of years to get it together and get the funding and all mm -hmm. of that. And it's coming in in twenty twenty five. There's going to be a theatrical release, and it's going to be on, I believe, uh, the CBC Documentary Channel as well. Are do you do you think that you will have any plans to do any live performances in conjunction 
with the the new doc- documentary that's coming in 2025? Oh yeah, babe, I'm gonna milk the shit out of it. <laughs> And do you think that's going to be a combination of solo and rough trade or what? I think it will be easier to do solo stuff. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, you know, we were talking about maybe doing songs, a couple of songs at some of the screenings. I don't know. We don't. Mm. We haven't really had intense discussions about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll see. So like I mentioned, you have uh, the new audiobook that's out now, a documentary coming in 2025. You currently have a couple singles that are out right now, uh, Play Fisty for Me and I Miss My Land. Uh, both are out on, uh, you know, people's favorite streaming services, that sort of thing, as well as on your band camp. For yourself, Carol Pope, at this point in your career, what what motivates you to want to make new music is, um, it, is it the person involved is it the theme of the the material it's just you know I mean just the world is so insanely screwed up that there's a never ending source yeah. of material um, I'm still I you know I pretty much write about the same subjects uh, human sexuality and the environment and politics and um have you always been political yeah um but i I certainly have written some funny songs too i mean like lesbians in the forest Mm -hmm. is pretty Mm -hmm. amusing um and play fisty is very funny too i think and i can't believe that it's gotten some airplay but (laughs) well it's gotten (laughs) airplay across canada on my show Yay! So, uh, so you just mentioned it. Play Fisty for me. What's that song about? It's. I was inspired by this movie from the seventies. It's just a play on words. Uh, play Misty for me about a stalker, um, which I've had in my life. It's about a stalker who's obsessed with this DJ uh, uh, played by Clint Eastwood, and he stupidly sleeps with her and then she's like obsessed with him and follows him everywhere and tries to kill him so really that was just a play on words and nobody has really i don't think there's been too many songs about fist fucking can i say that you Um, just did (laughs) (laughs) um so i don't know that you know fist fucking i'm not really a fan of it it's like (laughs) I'm like, oh, my hand hurts. I don't want to. <laughs> God. Your hand's too small. My hand's too No, I have pretty big hands. That's the problem. That's why people are like, Carol, would you mind? I mean, it doesn't happen that often. But anyway, um, but, you know, guys are into it. And apparently quite a few lesbians are into it. I didn't even know. Hmm. Well, I kind of, of course I do. Big Sir Malibu. that note, we'll return after this Rainbow Country update. I'm Billy Newton Davis, and we're sitting here on Rainbow Country with the fabulous Mark Tara. Hi, I'm Jamie B. of TG CD Style Toronto, and I'm a professional feminization makeup artist and stylist providing male-to-female transformations and mentoring to those who identify as a cross-dresser or a trans woman. I first heard of Rainbow Country and Mark Tara in trying to find a radio station that specifically caters to the LGBT community, and I'm so grateful I found this station. It's crucial having a platform like Rainbow Country that welcomes all aspects of the queer community, including allies like myself and what I do. 
It casts a spotlight on specific needs and interests of human beings, ensuring that people from all walks of life are being validated. It's a real privilege to be able to work with cross-dressers and trans women by helping them align themselves with their feminine energy through the glorious feminization process. So I want to thank Rainbow Country and Mark Tara for providing this platform for all of us. So, as you know, Rainbow Country airs on broadcast radio, streaming, and as an edited podcast. Most of those outlets and platforms are listener-supported. So, if you think what I'm doing here on Rainbow Country, working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond, is worthwhile, I hope you'll consider making a donation to this very outlet you are tuned to. If you happen to be listening to the edited podcast version, I hope you'll consider making a donation to an outlet that does carry Rainbow Country. How can you do this? Simple. Head over to marktara.com where everything is connected and hit the donation banner. That's where you'll find a list of all the outlets that carry Rainbow Country. A little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. Let your voice, let your support be heard. Hi, my name is Joanne Vanicola, and I'm an actor and a writer. And I was first on Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on discussing the massacre at Pulse Club in in Orlando. Um, I realized how important it was for our community to have a radio station uh, specifically for our issues to to talk about people in in the LGBTQ community and to provide an outlet for our stories, um, to discuss uh, our politics, culture, and give voice to the the issues that matter to us. And of course our artists and and, um, the things that we do globally and and to talk about culture and without people like Mark Tara uh, providing a space for this with, with a radio show like this then uh, we wouldn't have that voice so support tune in thank you hi I'm Eric Radford Olympic and world champion figure skater pianist and composer and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara Carol Pope, earlier I asked you, um, what what does what do the words, what does the term anti diva mean to you? Uh, in 2024, what do the words rough trade mean to you in 2024? Um. Well, uh, you know, rough trade. I think rough trade's material is still relevant. Unfortunately, our political stuff is still so relevant, like what's the Fuhrer about the Fuhrer and um, Endless Night and uh, Shaking the Foundations. They all work still today. And also, uh, we've been trying to make this musical happen forever and ever, Rough Trade the Musical, which is based on my brother's life in the 80s, 80s New York, And um, we've workshopped it a couple of times and we're trying to get the money to do another workshop to get some actual producers in the room so it can happen. So that's what rough trade means to me. Hmm. 
So you and Kevin Staples uh, started Rough Trade essentially in 1973. The two of you met in in the 60s and and had, what, O originally, and then that morphed into the the Bullwick Brothers, and then Rough Trade in in 73, uh, a pioneering uh, Canadian band, uh, new wave, synth, rock. Uh, You and Kevin Staples, Rough Trade went on to have, uh, what, Three Juno Awards, one Genie Award, one Double Platinum Award, one Platinum Award, and four Gold Albums. In your in your autobi in your autobiography, you write about Rough Trade being on tour with David Bowie, but essentially, you know, your record company didn't want to support you guys all the way because. David Bowie played in Toronto and then went on to do, I believe, Australia. And you guys couldn't do that leg of the tour because of the record company not supporting you guys, not supporting Rough Trade financially. Why was that? Why do you think that all happened, Carol? I think uh, CBS at the time was very small-minded. I I, I mean, I think, you know, I don't think that would happen today. I think it would would have gotten to our support, but they just didn't see the big picture of how that would help launch us in the rest of the world. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they're just cheap. You know, record companies. Record companies are nightmares. Do you think any of it had to do with taking Rough Trade seriously or not? No, I just, maybe they, yeah, maybe they didn't think we were worth investing in. I don't know. I don't know what the Mm -hmm. thoughts were behind all of that. But it was really depressing. I can imagine. What was? Didn't you? Didn't you like? Didn't Bowie? David Bowie come up on stage with you or something at some point? Oh no, he. Uh, well, I mean, he was on stage watching us when we first opened for him mm-hmm. at the Coliseum in Toronto. He was just watching, you know, checking out the band, and then we had a little chat later on. Mm-hmm. What was he like? He was. Very sweet and adorable and kind of gossipy and, <laughs> and very skinny because we hugged. And I'm like, oh, my God, you're so tiny. Mm. Um, but, yeah, he was just a very sweet man. What, was, was he, were you a fan of his? Oh, yeah, of course. Are you kidding? Um, and, oh. is, and is it true that R.E.M., REM opened up for Rough Trade in New York City. Is that true? Yeah, at a club called Danceteria. Mm-hmm. That's a famous, was a famous club. Oh, yeah. I mean, Madonna used to go there. Everybody mm-hmm. went there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they opened for us. This has happened a few times. Like, people have opened for us, and then they've gone on to become hugely famous. You mentioned it earlier. Uh, Rough Trade, the musical. I believe it was in, what, 2023, you guys had some uh, some live workshops where people were, you know, actors were performing your material. How did that all come about? Um, we got um, a large donation uh, from somebody, and uh, we decided to do this workshop in New York just to hone this the book, the script, and the music. And um, we had a lot of queer actors. I think everybody was queer in the whole cast, and there were a lot of young kids. And uh, there was they were crying every day because they were so moved by the script and the songs. And they were like, this speaks to me. Um, and uh, there was this one actor, Corey, who was a... a person of color and he sang prisoner of my skin and he said this song really speaks to me and i'm like i never thought of it that way because i'm white and i was writing it about sexuality and he's like no to me it's all about you know being a a black american an african-american um and and when those those performances were over and done with what was the response um 
Well, we we knew that we had we have the whole the whole thing is together now and it's ready to go. And then we also did a concert of the songs at Joe's Pub in New York. Um, and the only thing we really changed we had to get all new charts done, but now it really is ready to go. And but in order to get it produced, um, it takes yeah. money. It takes money, and, and a, we have. But there's also a, a GoFundMe campaign that's out right now, correct? Yeah, um, there is a GoFundMe cam- uh, campaign. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to get like thirty thousand dollars so we can mm-hmm. do another workshop in New York and invite producers. Mm-hmm. Um, and so ultimately, what would you like to happen with this? Like to be a musical where on Broadway at some point? Or off uh, anywhere, anywhere mm-hmm. on or near Broadway, <laughs> <laughs> anywhere in a theater, <laughs> anywhere in a damn theater. And I can't believe I have like in Canada that I can't. You know, everybody in Canada is just being just useless, and it's so annoying. Really? I, yeah, it's very annoying. Hmm. Why do you think that is? Oh God, I don't know. I don't understand. Um, you know, we should be at buddies and bad times, but I did, I did go see them. So, I, mm. um, and do you, think, you know, and do you think it, if you if you approach a place like buddies and bad times theater, that did they show interest in it? But it was a matter of you know like getting it financially stable to be able to mount it properly. Yeah, I mean, I think they. I, I don't know. I'm waiting to hear back. I mean, I think, yeah, it's it's not cheap to do it because it's mm-hmm. kind of a large cast. Mm-hmm. Um, and you also, too, want to do it, you want to put your best foot forward. You want to do it the right way. Yeah. I would think. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we can really, it is pretty pared down mm-hmm. um, staging-wise, but, you know, I think the most expensive thing is paying, you know, all the actors and the musicians. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it's just expensive. And the story that you're telling is 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 essentially what in in Rough Trade the musical? It's uh, based on my brother who moved to New York in the '80s and uh, uh, joined a band and become and became very active in ACT UP, who were the people responsible for. You know, hounding the government and doxers to uh, make some AIDS drugs because the epidemic was raging, um, and it's also there's a younger me in it, played by Chelina Kennedy. Um, so it's it's my relationship with Howard and the whole scene, the whole New York club scene, and um, yeah, it's like a as Kate says, it's a wham, bam, glam musical. It, it kind of, although I've never seen this musical, but it kind of sounds like Rent. It's, well, Rent is, it's much edgier than Rent. And it's, you know, it's really my relationship with my brother. Um, and what a brave person he was because he, you know, he had a protected sex with somebody that he was obsessed with and then he, you know, got ill and uh, anyway So in, in 2020, you and Kevin Staples were inducted into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame for High School Confidential. What does yes. what did what did getting that uh, that accolade? What did that mean? What does that mean to you, to you, Carol Pope? Well, it's great to get recognized as songwriters. So um, yeah, we we're very honored that that happened. Mm-hmm. 
And and that song, High School Confidential, really, you know, put yourself, Kevin Staples, Rough Trade on the map. What's the genesis of High School Confidential? Well, actually, uh, Kevin and I were working on a movie called Cruising uh, with Jack Nietzsche, produced by William Friedkin. Uh, Al Pacino was the lead actor. Um, it was a very controversial film at the time about a gay serial killer. Now it's a big cult film. Anyway, um, we Mick DeVille was also working on it, and I wrote, actually wrote that song for him. And it, you know, I'm like, here's a song about drag queens, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, no, it's too literal. We don't want to use it. So then I was like, I'm going to sing it. So that's how that happened. Hmm. Are you glad you sang it? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so High School Confidential, you just said drag queens. Is High School Confidential essentially about drag queens then? It's about, I think when I wrote it was, was like, just, it was kind of inspired by somebody in high school, but then I'm like, it's really about a drag queen. I mean, it's like, so just somebody who was over the top sexually, mm. um, who would sashay down the hall. Is this Craig Russell? No, but Craig Russell did go to my high school. Mm-hmm. That's why I asked. <laughs> Someone I got, else. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't really know. I don't think I met Craig when we were in school together, but I met him later on, and mm-hmm. he was just phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a great female impersonator. Oh, my God. Ama- an amazing, amazing and underrated. Outrageous. Such a good movie. Outrageous. Yeah. It, so in... in 2023, Carol Pope, Kevin Staples, Rough Trade, inducted into the Canadian Walk of Fame. What did that accolade mean to you? What does it mean to you? Uh, Again, uh, very honored to be. It's the Rock of Fame, actually. It's like a subcategory of the Walk of Fame. Mm. Uh, But um, I don't know. We're very honored to be included in that and Mm. recognized as a band. Mm -hmm. Um, because I do think Rough Trade is underrated as a band Mm -hmm. I mean a lot of people love Rough Trade but you know uh, we were we were ahead of our time Mm -hmm. and uh, I'm always over the years I'm like oh we already did we did that first yeah yeah I was going to ask you do you think that do you think that the Canadian music industry underrated rough trade um yeah i think they did and i think that i was typecast and um by the media and they're all they're all like carol pope branch queen blah 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 and i don't think they appreciated the work as much as i would have liked but they didn't cre- they didn't appreciate the art the the songwriting and the art that goes into that yeah, to tell provocative stories and stories that are relevant decades later. Yeah, exactly. Crazy. Getting, getting the, 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 the rock of fame, getting that, that award, that accolade, did it feel as if it was justification in some way, shape or form? Oh yeah, it absolutely did. Um, it was just a great feeling to be recognized and uh, to be in the room with all those amazing bands. A lot of them I'd never met before. Um, so yeah, it was an amazing night at, at Massey Hall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were people like Lee Aaron and and Prism uh, from the 70s that uh, Jim Valens was a member of and helped start. Uh, yeah, well done, well done. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, I'm, you know, it's, it's funny because, uh, the, I love your music and I love your albums, 
And I was just so surprised that you put out, what, three, four albums in total? Oh, uh, Rough Trade or my yeah. solo stuff? No, you're, Rough Trade. Uh, how many albums we did? Rough Trade Live, Avoid Freud, Weapons, For Those Who Think Young, Shaking the Foundations. So five, mm-hmm. six. What One of those tracks, uh, Sexual Cowboy... I love that track. Oh, Sexual Outlaw, you mean? Sexual Outlaw. Sexual Outlaw. Yeah. Oh, it. thank you. Love yeah, I like, I like that song too, yeah. Mm-hmm. Another one of your tracks that I absolutely love, the, one of your solo tracks, Francis Bacon. Oh, great. Thank you. And I love that. I love my bacon crispy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but Francis Bacon... Who is that? Tr- who is that song about? It's really about Dusty Springfield. Mm-hmm. Um, how did how did the two of you meet? We met through my manager at the time, Vicky Wickham, in New York, and she said you should meet Dusty <laughs> Springfield. Not letting me know that she was quite a handful. So um, <laughs> I just went to see her perform live at a club called the Grand Finale. Mm. And I think 1981, and uh, Rock Hudson was in the audience, and Fran Lebowitz, and Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. I can't remember. (laughs) Jane Seymour. Jane Seymour. (laughs) Um, Why did I know that name so readily? Because it's your job. As a gay, gay and I'm a a purveyor of him for you to know that. Well, but, love did, you for it. but didn't and how and you, yourself and Dusty Springfield were you guys were lovers yeah how long were you together for I it was so traumatic that I, I think like a year and a half and we lived together for about six months and it was a nightmare <laughs> but um but you guys also created some great art together I know that some of your your music was on her one of her albums, White Heat. Yeah, which is a very underrated album mm-hmm. of hers. Uh, yeah, she did a cover of Softcore, and we wrote this song called "I'm Curious" for her. Mm-hmm. Very Prince. Um, it, yeah, it was very Prince. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, I. I mean, you know, she had drugs and alcohol issues. And then she finally got sober a few years later. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was happy for that. And I I was really thrilled when she worked with the Pet Shop Boys. That Mm -hmm. was amazing. That Um, was amazing. She sounded and looked great. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And looking back now, your time with her, with Dusty Springfield, like a musical legend... How do you see your time with her? Well, I mean, in retrospect, I, you know, there was like so many red flags and I knew that she had drinking and drugging issues. And um, so I never would have, you know, I might have had an affair with her, but I never would have lived with her. Um, But she was just fascinating to be with. And I just used to make her tell me stories about her career and, how she recorded and, uh, you know, I thought she was a genius. I thought she was just an amazing musician and singer and nobody has a voice like that. Mm -hmm. Wow. 2025 is going to be a great year for Carol Pope. Woohoo! A documentary, live performing uh, performances. Are you looking forward to 2025? I am. And I'm actually... Doing, uh, I'm playing Used Room again with Tim Welch on September twenty uh, September nineteenth. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're playing That's in Peter Toronto. Brooklyn. Yeah, and mm-hmm. we're playing. Uh, well, everything's going to be listed at your website, right? CarolPope.com. Yeah, people, people can look at my website. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, I'm getting distracted by the helicopters. But I don't know if you can hear them or not. <laughs> No, not on my, not on, not on my end. I don't hear it. I don't hear it. Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, it's like they're dive bombing. <laughs> um, 
Yes, you can look at my website and see where I'm playing. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, are you? Do you think you'll do uh, a track like "Play Fisty for Me" live? Oh yeah, we are. We are doing it live. Oh, excellent. Yeah, of course we're <laughs> gonna do it. <laughs> Well, Carol Pope, I have to say, this has been a delight. Uh, always a pleasure to, to, to chat with you and to to hear your amazing stories. Hello, David Bowie. I know. Amazing. Thank you for your time. Thanks for being on the show. And I'm sure we'll talk again in 2025 when the documentary comes out. Oh, absolutely. And, and thanks for supporting... Uh, uh, rough trade and and uh me as artists we really appreciate it absolutely of course thanks for your time thanks for being on the show be well carol pope thanks you too you anti-diva you Audiobook for Carol Pope's autobiography, Anti Diva, is out now wherever you get your favorite books and audiobooks. Keep an eye out for the documentary, Anti Diva The Confessions of Carol Pope, coming in 2025. As always, you can stream Carol Pope's music and Rough Trades music on your favorite streaming service. And for even more on this agent provocateur, simply visit carolpope.com. Bill 7. To ban discrimination in employment, government services, and housing, based on a person's sexual orientation, was up for a vote at Queen's Park. Most NDP and Liberal MPPs supported the bill. But without some progressive conservative legislators backing, a divisive split could rack the province. Four PCs decided to break party ranks to vote with their conscience and support Bill 7. Cabinet Minister and MPP Dennis Timbrell did it to show solidarity for his beloved brother, the well-known drag queen, Rusty Ryan. And for me, a gay politician who was not yet out, I had to take a stand. We were known as the Gang of Four, I'm former Cabinet Minister and MPP Phil Gillies. The date, December 2nd, 1986, when LGBT rights came to Ontario. And just like that, this little gay journey through Rainbow Country has come to an end. For the full two-hour episode, simply head over to marktara.com where everything is connected and hit the archives banner keep up to date with the show, check out my socials at Mark Tara. The podcast is available on all major platforms. And finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, we are living in days of making dreams come true, so believe in yourself and the world will believe in you. Hi, this is Amanda Marshall, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara.